Hey, we want to welcome those joining us online right now. We appreciate you tuning in to Navigation Church. For those that are joining us live, one of the things we've been saying is there's no shame in your game. So if you feel comfortable coming to our council campus or watching us in our online campus, we're excited about that. I need to do this right now. If you have your phone, if you're on any type of social media, go ahead and pull it out. I need you to do me a favor for those watching online. I have a massive question that we got to get figured out. So if you're pulling out your phone and you're checking into Facebook or something, go ahead and check in. And here's the question I have for you. If something breaks at the house, is it him or her that's getting the phone call? Like, who, who's the fixer at your house? Is it her or is it him? And then here's the other question. Or is it other? Because if I'm really honest about my house, my wife is probably going to be the fixer because she's going to call her dad before I know what's going on. <laughs> And by the way, I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad at it at all because currently, like, and I'll just be honest with you, like, my van, when we drive now, there's something loose underneath, and there's, like, this massive rattle. And I live by the philosophy it always fixes itself. Not this one. We're a week into it. I'm calling a buddy today to say, hey, I'm going to need some help here because it's clang, 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 and we're that family. And so, so it, even if I get the phone call, it's to only call someone else. So if you're checking in online, this is, that's as true as it gets. And if you just follow my wife out today, you'll hear it. So like, if you check in online right now or if you're watching us, here's what I need to know. Are you the fixer? Is she the fixer or is it other? And I'm just kind of curious if... It call a professional. I love that answer. You're never wrong there. Uh, here's where we're at. We're in a conversation called the five P's and I'm going to jump right into it today. And the reason why is I'm going to do a single sermon that should be three sermons. So just be ready. We're going to just download some information. What are the five P's? Uh, years ago, I read a book by the, um, a man named Andy Stanley. Uh, it, the book was called Deep and Wide. And it's a, it's really a book on how he built his church, why he built it the way he did it, and a lot of the philosophies behind it. And as I was reading through the book, I got to this one section where he said, as he, as he looked backwards on Christian's life, Christians who developed, Christians who grew, Christian who always took their next step, he found five distinctive things in their life that you should be able to find in your own life. Three of them we can intentionally do Two kind of get thrust upon us. And so we're talking about these five Ps. The one we talked about last week was, remember the paintbrush? Practical teachings. So the Bible is like a can of paint. It's really beautiful what's inside of it. But if you want to know its true value, you have to do what? You have to dip in and apply it to your life through practical teachings. Does anyone feel like you're in like fourth grade right now and the teacher has all this ad? Don't worry. Today I'm going to ask you a question. What is a nail? What is a toolbox? And what is a chalk, chalk line have to do with today's sermon? So don't worry. The analogies keep coming. So, so number one, when it comes to practical teachings, are you taking the word of God and practically applying them to your life. And we even explored how Jesus last week did not teach to head knowledge. He taught to practical application. So this week, we're going to talk about private disciplines. We're then going to continue on when it comes to your personal ministry. Your personal ministry being if you only take and take and take and take, eventually you become a dead sea because you have to f figure out how to give. Your vessel can only contain so much. And unless you have a personal ministry where you're giving to others, sowing into others, blessing other people, eventually you can't actually die in your spiritual walk. So those are the three tools that we can on purpose do. You, you can practically apply the word. You can practically practice your disciplines. You can practically learn how to bless other people. The other two kind of get thrusted upon us a lot of times. One is a pivot, pivotal moment. How many have ever been living in life in 2020 and everything seems to shift real fast? That right then is when you're supposed to just say amen because that's true for all of us. But in that, in that pivot moment, are we pivoting towards God or away from God? So that's almost, if you can say, a reactionary thing. And then the other one is providential relationships. We'll talk about this our final week. How many have ever had a friend pop back in your life when you were in a low moment where life pivoted on you and you just needed assistance, you needed that helping hand, and that right person happened to be there for you, by chance came into your life? I believe God sends us providential relationships and those providential relationships help us take our next step in a growing relationship with Jesus. So here's what we're going to do today, private disciplines. By the way, this is a sermon I can't wait to preach because all of us need to do it on a regular basis, but I guarantee none of you are going to say amen when I say I'm going to talk about tithing, I'm going to talk about prayer, and I'm going to talk about fasting. 
One, and that was a courtesy. One person, those watching online, you didn't hear it. You know why you couldn't hear it? No one really did it. One person gave me a courtesy. Because when I say I'm going to encourage you not to eat food for a long period of time, you don't want to go, sounds like a good idea. But I want to explain how a nail, a chalk box, and a toolbox have to do with Matthew chapter 6 and why each one of them matters. So if you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 6. If you, if you don't have your Bible and maybe you just want to follow us along, see what we're reading about, download our app and all the today's sermon notes, which by the way, today's sermon notes is just a lot of scripture. Because you have Jesus, who we covered this last week, but I'll remind you, he walked up a mount, and on that mount he did a sermon, so we get the phrase sermon on the Mount, okay, really simple. This is, this is how difficult the Bible is for us to know. So Jesus is up there and he's doing a teaching and he starts with this. He says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness. This is verse one, chapter six, before men to be seen by them. Now pause real quick. See that phrase act of righteousness. If you have a paper Bible, if you can make notes in your app, I'm going to encourage you to change the Bible. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Proper reaction when anyone says that. But what about instead of acts of righteousness, what if we said this phrase, your private disciplines? So I I, want to get that phrase in because Jesus is about to give us three different things. And when it comes to your private disciplines, let's not do them before man to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. And this reward word is huge because you're going to see Jesus doesn't accidentally throw this out here. He actually repeats it on a regular basis. So by the way, when you do your private disciplines, I, by the way, I can just, I can feel the energy coming up. I got a couple goosebumps going on. When I say this, you're going to want to say amen. Three of you are going to shout. Two of you are going to whistle. And one person may pass out. This is so exciting. Ready for this? When you do your private discipline, God promises you that there are spiritual rewards for you. I mean, what, I mean, what a thought. Because there's sometimes in our Christian life, we just go, I'm doing this because I'm supposed to do this. But every once in a while, and it could just be a, the guy thing in me, but if you dangle a carrot out in front of me, I'll start following it. Man, I get, I get something because I'm something that's known as a cleric. A, other groups would call it a, um, a, a type three. I'm a task-oriented person. And if I'm going to do a task, I want to see the end in sight. And to just do tasks, if you told me today, I'll pay you $1,000 to move those bricks from point A to point B, I'm probably somewhere along the line going to go, well, why? But if I come back tomorrow and another $1,000 to move them back to where they were, at some point I lose energy real quick. I don't care how much I love money. And I think we've covered this. I'm really cheap. But I also like me. And I'm not going to do something just to do something. And Jesus just told me here that if I do these practic- um, private disciplines, there's a reward waiting for you. And then Jesus says this. I love it. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as hypocrites in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. Now, just this is great. We got to pause again. I, I, don't worry. We have a lot of scriptures, but this is, this is one more reason why I love Jesus. So, so for those watching online, you don't see this, but I have a row over here that's completely empty. So let's like, like, act like that row over there, is full of some people from a synagogue. They, they're fully dressed in white. They have these beautiful long talits and flowing robes, and they have jewels all over them. And they're known as Pharisees. Have you ever heard that word before? Pharisees, Sadducees, th- them you see. Like, it, there's a whole group over there. And so Jesus, he says this. He goes, listen, when you give to the needy, and he kind of pivots and goes, don't be like those guys. <laughs> And the rest of us know exactly what he's talking about because those guys make us feel bad because we're not like those guys. And what he's saying is the reason they feel bad, make you feel bad, is because anytime they give to the needy, they go, hey, listen up. See this person who can't afford anything? I'm about to give them money. You probably can't because you're poor too. But I'm so rich. God has blessed me so much. I'm going to be able to take care of them. And then you sit there feeling like putzes because you can't do it. Putz is a Hebrew word. You can look it up for yourself. Like you feel bad about it. And all of a sudden you don't feel that you can be spiritual because you don't look like them and you don't walk like them and you don't talk like them. And Jesus looks right, right at him and goes, Don't be like them. All of us, don't you love Jesus a little bit more right now? 
because you can't be them. And truthfully, you don't want to be them. And he says, so when you give it to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. Like, you know, those people over there in the all white robes, like those hypocrites, because they're just trying to be honored by men. I tell you the truth that you have received your reward. There's that word again. You've received your reward in, 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 in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret, that your father who's, who sees what is done in secret re- will reward you. So what is the first pri- private discipline that we're going to talk about? It's giving. It's tithing. It's actually investing finances that you have. And pretty soon you're going to see that we're going to cover three specific areas. And there's a reason why I believe Jesus is hitting on these things. But when it comes to your tithing, what is this? This is when you take 10% of your income and you give it away. And right now, I challenge you to do this. Find someone who's not a Christian, who's very wealthy, who's written a book, and here's one thing that I guarantee you're going to find in every one of their books. They say this, you have to give back to the thing you're taking out of. They don't even know that they're actually activating a reward. They're activating a principle that God has in the Bible, but it's the reward of tithing. And when I think about tithing, here's what I think about. I actually think about a nail. Why do I think about a nail? Because, you know, I've actually had the opportunity to build three houses for myself. And I know you're looking at me going, I didn't know he knew how to do carpentry work. I don't. I know how to call professionals. I think we covered that already. (laughs) But, you know, of all three houses that I've built, no one has ever walked in the door and said this. Wow, those nails look really good. Not one person. They've talked about room size, which, by the way, room size, 10 by 10. Anyone else have those bedrooms, right? Like when I I don't have a big foyer with rounding staircases. Keep in mind, I built it. So no one ever walked in and talked about, you know, your nails are really symmetrical. You have done a good job squaring things up. Well, they've talked about squaring things up. They've talked about how, how the layout is nice. But you know what's interesting? That if you take the nails out of the construction, the thing falls apart. The, one of the most important things that you even do to a house, no one even recognizes or highlights. And why do I say that? When it comes to tithing, I believe tithing is the thing that nails your spiritual life together. Tithing is a spiritual principle that God says this, that if you give to me in a tithing sense, because keep in mind, there's tithing, there's alms, there's first fruits, and then there's offerings. Has anyone ever said to you this? I need you to give today because God will take it, press it down, shake it together, and it will be what? Running. Running over back to you. Only if you're giving offerings. That's the promise associated with offerings. If you're giving alms, if you're blessing poor people, here's what God promised you. God promises you that he'll give you the money back. That if you give to the needy, it's like me giving to the needy, so I'm going to make sure just to pay you back. First fruits is if you ever get a first a job, a, 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 a brand new job, a brand new business, a brand new investment. First fruit says this, when you get that first paycheck from it, you give 100% of it away. Why do you say that? You're saying to God, I... I guarantee God, I'm trusting you so much that I'll receive more fruit from this harvest field that I don't have to take the first of it. I can give the first to you. And then here's what God promises you. I'll guarantee that harvest field keeps giving to you. Every investment Cammie and I have ever done, every business venture outside of the church, the very first check we ever received, 100% of it went to God. And I can promise you, every one of them continue to pay. But you know what tithing says? Tithing says If you tithe, I will be your protection. I will be the thing that holds your world together. And so God is saying this, that if you choose to do this, hey, everyone, I'm giving again. Hey, everyone, look at me. I tithe 10%, 12%, 15%. Everyone, God's saying this, that the reward that everyone gives you right then is to validate your generosity. That's the gift. But I personally would rather God hold my life together. And so when it comes to nail, why do I look at it? Because tithing, and and here's the thing, tithing should happen. And if I could just take a moment to be real with you. And by the way, if you're a guest here, you should know that, yes, there will be an opportunity to give at the end of service. But if you're our guest here today, eat for free. Can I say it that way? But let's think about this in a real practical level. As a church, from last year to this time, to this year in this time, 
we're down 13% in our giving. And the only difference is there was a large season where we weren't here on a regular basis. So do you drive in nails because you want your life held together? Or when you come here, it just reminds you to give? I would say this, tithing and generosity should be a lifestyle, not an occasional thing because a pocket went by and you dropped something in. Or can we use a practical analogy? If Navigation Church is the place you come to get fed from on a regular basis, what happens if you go to a local restaurant, eat all the time, then just walk out and leave without paying your check? I have a feeling someone's coming after you. If you're part of Navigation Church on a regular basis, the table is set because everyone helps pay the bill. And the beautiful thing about tithing, I love this. I told you, I told you I'm going to do three sermons in one and I shouldn't do this. You know what the, the beautiful thing about tithing in the economy that God has set up? God has actually set up a check and balance system between the pastors and the priests that are preaching and the people that are hearing. And here's what the beautiful check and balance is. Right now, I could do a six-month series about give, and it'll be given unto you. Give, and God will bless you with millions of dollars. And we could raise, uh, in, in, in this church, we could raise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, by preaching a feel-good message like that. I'm going to preach to you about grace, and when you give to God, you can live whatever lifestyle you want. And people would be given, and they're thinking they're paying off God to live everything you want. But you know what eventually happens? The church will be bankrupt because you're spiritually bankrupt. God has built in a check and balance system for me to give you your daily bread. Don't worry, I'll cover that in about 30 seconds. To give you your daily bread, and sometimes you may not want to eat that. You may not want to hear that. And do you think it's comfortable for someone to stand up in front of you and tell you you should give away money for nothing? No, that's not the most comfortable place for pastors to be. But here's the thing. I need to preach that to you because when I preach that to you, you live a healthier life. The healthier life you live, you continue to have resources. You continue to have finances. You continue to have a healthy marriage. And because of that, you can give to the church. And so if I give to you in a healthy way, you give to the church in a healthy way. And it's actually a check and balance system that God has put into place when it comes to money. Man, it's almost like he thought this thing through. It's beautiful. So, when it comes to your private discipline, give. Period. Next thing. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. He just, he, he, I, I love Jesus so much here. Don't be like those people right over there. See, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue on the street corner to be seen by men. And I tell you the truth, that the reward that they're seeking for, they fully got paid in full here on earth. There's actually one story, if you want to know how Jesus is, I think it's Luke 18. There's actually a Pharisee that comes in to pray at the synagogue. And here's what his prayer is. Dear God, I am so grateful I'm not like that tax collector. How would you like me to start the morning off by, God, I am so grateful I'm me and not you. <laughs> First of all, see ya. Like I, you're, you're, but then why is it by devaluing one person, it somehow brings value to us? I, I'm sorry, am I talking about prayer now or am I talking about our society? Right? How is it devaluing this people group, devaluing this color, devaluing this political, devaluing, how is it devaluing that somehow elevates us unless we're seeking a reward right here, right now for us? But Jesus says, why don't you not do it like that? But why don't you pray? Why don't you go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then you, oh, you're ready for this. I love this. Then your father who sees what is being done in secret will reward you. And by the way, when you pray, this is, I'm just going to summarize the next couple of scriptures. Ready for this? You just say, my father, who's heaven, who's in heaven. Why? Because I'm not talking about my dad who lives on the other side of town. I'm talking about a spiritual father that when I was born again, brought me into his family. And I'm going to start with worship. Hallowed be thy name. 
you are worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my time to give to you. You're worthy of these words that I want to express to you. Hallowed be thy name. And by the way, I know that I have some issues. I got a son with a broken arm and we got school coming up and there's some bills to pay. Does anyone have these prayers either? You ready for this? Like I got a van that goes <laughs> every time I run over anything. So, oh good, your van does it too. Maybe mine isn't broken. So I got some to-do list at the house and I tried to power wash last weekend, true story. And I gave up about one fifth of the way through and I lit the thing on fire. So like, God, I have all these issues, but I know I want to bring these things. I did not, I did not burn it down. I, I had a sawzall. No, like, like I know how to work that. So like, I want to bring these types of things into prayer, but God, I just got done worshiping you. And when I got done worshiping you, I saw how great you are. I saw how big you are. I saw how beautiful you are. And the only thing I can ask from you right now is let your kingdom come. Let your, let your thinking, let your life, let your world, let your belief system, let it come into my world on my earth as it is in heaven. Because God, when I look at heaven, it says that there's no tears. The rust, rust and moth doesn't grow. God, when I look at this place in heaven where worship is happening and harmony and beauty between nations and people and tongues, God, I want that for my earth. I want that here. I want that peace that surpasses all understanding here on earth. So God, I have all this junk that I'm dealing with, but right now, Oh, do I have a perspective of who you are? Amen. Oh God, but there's a chance that when I'm asking for this, there's a chance that, uh, that I'm going to have some temptations that I need to deal with. God, there's a chance in order for me to become that vessel that can handle heaven on earth, I'm going to need some nutrition that I don't have now. So give me this day, my daily bread. And even though I want my daily bread to be an angel cream filled chocolate donut, and it's tasty and it's perfect every time with 2% milk that you drink out of the container. By the way, if you ever come to my house, I drink out of the container. Kids aren't allowed to, but here's the problem with getting a cup. What if you put too much or what if you put too little? When you drink out of the container, it's the perfect amount every time. And you, you, you can say that's not right, but if you think about it, I am. So I don't mind boasting on that. You, you, you don't have enough, then you have to go get a little bit more, but you're right in the middle of a swallow and that got everything. But then you leave a little bit, and I don't know if you know this, I'm cheap. So you got to drink the rest of it. And then you had too much milk. Then you have to eat another donut and your insulin's kicking in and you've got sweats going on and you're like, why is this? And then you take a nap and the world falls apart. And it wouldn't have if you just would have drank out of the container. You're welcome. That's the daily bread I would like. But sometimes God says this, I have a tomato on the plate for you. I have Brussels sprouts. I have your veggies. I have beets, which is basically dirt. Let's just be honest. Love you're wrong. Well, I love you, brother. I love beets. If you're online right now and you love beets, put it there. We are going to start a whole group just of beet lovers. And then the rest of us will come and beat you. So like... So you have them growing in your yard? Yeah, they're called weeds, and so you can spray for them. But what happens when God says, this is the nutrients you need, and by the way, we call it beets, but other people call it a beat down. Your daily bread has to be rumors against you, gossip against you, anger against you, racism against you. God, how do I live with that? Because I'm asking for heaven to be on earth, but if I don't respond re correctly, I'm basically releasing hell in my world. And Jesus is saying, this is how you pray. And you know what I think prayer is? I know this is going to sound weird. And by the way, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but just saying it. How many, uh, how many have a toolbox at home that when you get done building the bed from Ikea, putting together the bike from Walmart. There's always two or three little extra screws and nuts and bolts. And, and there's just kind of a container you have at home that goes with it. So I have a container that I actually got from my grandpa. I remember being in his garage my whole life. And to this day, the, the other day I had this great idea, and this is going to sound so weird. I made a floating green because I was going to a friend's house and I thought we should throw it in his pool and try to chip balls onto it. It worked, by the way. No one more surprised than me. But, and I drove over there in my van. Like, <laughs> but as I'm trying to screw these foam things in, I needed some washers. And I went over and I started going through Grandpa's box. And wouldn't you know, I found a whole drawer of the washers I needed. How many ever have your, paper, your toilet paper holder? One of them start getting loose. 
Well, I found out why ours was because when my baby girl, not to name names, when she gets up, apparently this is the handle she uses. <laughs> and I needed to put an anchor in the wall, and once you know, I found the anchor I needed, and I needed the right size screw to go in this, once you know. Grandpa had stored up all these things throughout time that when they were needed, I was able to pull from it. And I believe prayer works the same way. See, we want prayer to be this, that when I need it, I pray it, he gives it. God ain't your Home Depot. He's your, not your one-stop shop that you go get what you need to fix what you have because there's a chance God's saying this, why don't over time you just begin storing things away? Why don't over time when you have your private disciplines in your closet that no one's seeing and you're asking God to come on the earth? And he goes, listen, I wanted to come on earth, but currently you're the thing standing in the way. Currently, you're the hell I'm trying to get over with the heaven that you're asking for. So I'm going to start doing some work. And God starts adding some little tools to your bull two box. And then something comes along where a friend attacks, a relative says this, a bankruptcy occurs, you get fired. And rather than scrambling around, you know what you go? You go to that trusty prayer closet. And you say, this is what you said to me before. And this is where you met me before. And this is what you delivered me from before. And you Pull out that private discipline of prayer because you have stored it up over time. How, of, how offensive, how foolish, how crazy would it be that our God should be just our genie? I know we want it to be the Aladdin. We know we want to be able to rub it and it just comes out, but he's going, listen, if you do that, you should just know you're going to get your reward because if you can sound pretty in front of men, they're going to think you're spiritual. But the fact is, I want to be intimate. Can I tell you what the pastor's greatest concern is anytime he preaches on prayer? Anytime I preach on prayer, and I would maybe say this would be true of other people that I know, is that you feel like we're encouraging you to talk a lot. Here's what the sermon on the prayer is all about. Here's how you connect to God. And if you want your reward, you have an intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one conversation with Him, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the world hears, sees, or does. And Jesus says, this is your private discipline. Pray. I have a question for you. We're currently in Matthew 6 talking about private disciplines, and the one we're specifically talking about is prayer. If I were to say to you as a pastor, true story, if 100% honest with you right now, I just want to let you know that I don't pray. I never pray. I don't bother praying. I don't get praying. Uh, I've never seen the fruit of prayer. And I'm just letting you know, honestly, and this is just a question. If I were to say to you, I don't pray, and I never pray, and I never plan on praying, what's your immediate thought? What's your immediate response? Would you say, that's a bad pastor? Right? Because don't all of you, those watching online, those listening to me live right here, you just kind of assume a part of a, part of a pastor's job description is to pray. Am I off there? And if you found out that I just don't pray, I don't get prayer, and I never talk to God, wouldn't you almost think, I don't think that's a very good pastor? What's the difference between you and I? except I have a piece of paper on my wall with a specific degree. Jesus didn't say, I need my spiritual leaders to pray like this. He said this, that if you are a follower of me, this is how you do what we do. So if you'd be offended at a pastor who never prayed, what's the difference with me being offended by a Christian who never talks to God? Just a thought for you to chew on until we get to the fun one. Now Jesus says this, when you fast, by the way, when we talk fast, let's just be very clear, no food. I know there's types of fastings out there and I'm not saying anything uh, pro or con against them, but Jesus here, we talking about no food. When you fast, do not look somber. Oh, like the hypocrites do. 
pointing out that everything that they do and how they do it and the way they've been doing it, I'm not that and I don't want that for you. He said, you know, they just figure their faces to show men that they're fasting. Oh, I'm so hungry. I'm sorry, has anyone ever been around someone who's fasting and you think, boy, are they fasting to find God or to let people know how spiritual they are? Right? And so I tell you the truth. They have their full what? Reward. They're getting what they want. Everyone around them thinks that they're spiritual. But I'm telling you this, that when you fast, why don't you take a bath? Wash up. Put some oil on your face. Spray some of your body wash. And try not to look like you're doing it on the outside so the inside can do its full work inside of you. I might have added a little to Scripture 17 right there, but I think you kind of get the point. That was the amplified version. So it's not obvious to men that you're fasting, but do it only to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what's being done in secret will what? Reward you. Here's how I look at fasting. I look at it like a chalk line. So in the different houses that I build, there's times that you try to set a wall. You try to put on plywood, something like that. And there's times that you can see that, oh, this looks square. Or there's a time where you're raising a back wall that you need to kind of get your plumb line. You got to have that straight line. So you make a mark here and you make a mark there. And even if you kind of set the wall up, you can go, okay, well, that side's touching and this side's touching. But it isn't until you take the invisible and make it visible to see where you really are. And when it comes to fasting, there's times where you know where you're starting and when you know where you're ending. But it isn't until you pop that chalk line that you can see the clear road that is in front of you that needs to make sure your life is plumb, your life is square. And the only way to do that is to strip away everything in your life that keep you from being able to see God clearly. And if you've never done, and this, this, let's just say, this may be a challenge for you. If you've never done a three-day water only fast. And please keep in mind, I can give you a bunch of caveats. If you suffer from a physical illness, if you're under medical care because of diabetes or something like that, or you're currently going through a cancer treatment, like please just, I'm making a general term here. Can everyone say amen to that? Just so I feel like I gave enough of a caveat on that. But if you're a healthy individual and you've never done a three day water only fast, may I just tell you this now? You will never hear from God more clearly than when you strip all of that stuff out of our life that we crave for. And now I know medically, there's a couple things that happens when you start stripping your body of all these other chemicals, keystones, ketones around day number three start firing. It's some of the cleanest energy that you can have. I understand, and yes, that is all true, medically speaking. But what if God knew, medically speaking, what your body would do when he says, why don't you strip away the junk so you can get closer to me? And there's something about stripping this thing away and fasting and finding God. And there's some places, you know, the disciples at one time said, Jesus, we went to pray for this group and nothing happened. Like the demons didn't leave. And he said, you know, these only leave through prayer and fasting. There's levels of spirituality that you can only go to if you're willing to pay the price that other people won't. So you have this discipline of fasting that God has called you to. So what are our three spiritual disciplines? Number one, it's the thing that holds your life together. Tithing, giving, being generous. Number two, two, it's the prayer stored up for the days that are to come that you can always go to. They'll probably be the resources that you need. And number three, it's the chalk line to make sure that you are staying square in the invisible. But I, I find it interesting. Why these three? Of all the things, why not volunteer at the church? Why not help poor people? Why not, why, why not worship? Why not? You can go to all these things and God, why did you pick these three? And if you think about it, these three things that Jesus is asking for are three things that we have limited resources of. You only have so much money. Can I get an amen from everyone? And if you don't say amen, I'd like to talk to you about a building project we're going to be starting soon. Like, but money's not a problem for you. This may not be an issue, but here's the thing. When it comes to monetary gains, when it comes to consumerism, money is the number one feeder for that. And it's also the limited resource that we have. And God's saying this, will you give me a portion back of what you have a limit of? And the greatest way 
to keep consumerism out of your life, to take greed away from you, is to actually always keep it at bay by saying, you won't control me, but I will control it. So we have limited amount of money. Are we willing to give that back to God? You know what we have? We have a limited amount of time. And I'm going to tell you that every day you need to do five, 50, five hours, whatever, whatever you need to be at, of time away from the TV, family, reading, bicycle, the fixing a van, whatever it might be. Like You need to be by yourself talking to the unseen. And you need to spend that time. There's one commodity no one can ever make more of, and that's time. And so this limited commodity, are you willing to give it to God? And so God's always going to ask something of us in that area. And then the third one, when it comes to food, I've always heard it said this way. You can go without air for three minutes and go without water for three days and you can go without food for three weeks. But ultimately you die if we don't have this resource. Are we willing to say to God, the thing that I need the most to survive, I will give up because the thing I need the most to survive is you. I think it's beautiful how these three things are. And then God's saying this, when it comes to your reward, you should know that other people are going to talk about a reward here on earth because people are seeing them. But I'm telling you now that when you are someone who's giver, if you're someone who tithes, if you're someone who invests, your reward is my protection. When it comes to you uh, praying, my reward for you is this, intimacy, closeness and knowing helping you live here on earth and the things that are in heaven that are stored up can be released into your life you want to know what my reward is everything that keeps us separated with through fasting will help separate or clear those things out of your life so you can be connected to me i think it's an absolutely beautiful thing that god says here when it comes to our private devotions and here's the last thing i'm going to say to you on this he gives it to us in a practical teaching. The only way to have these three things active in your life is if you actually practically apply them. So how do you do that? Send an alarm on your clock. When are you going to pray every day? What is the designated time? And by the way, can you do me a favor? Everyone listen to me real quick. Don't start with an hour. I don't know where it came that an hour is the magical time that Christians have to pray. Every prayer meeting I've been to, it's one hour long. We're going to have a prayer night. How long is it? 60 minutes. I don't know. There's a magical thing. But don't just have vain, repetitious words. I would encourage you this. Start out with two. See if you can go two whole minutes without your mind wandering. Something amazing happens when you start praying. You start remembering everything you need to remember in that moment. <laughs> How many know that to be true? It's the same thing when you read. When you read, it's an amazing ability to put you to sleep. Like, yes. right? So how do you start this private discipline? You just start. How do you start giving? Well, you can say, well, I'm going to work towards my budget and I'll see what opens up. Or you can do this. You give God first. And you know what happens? God, it's almost like taxes. The government, it's, they're brilliant. Here's what they do. They take your money before you ever get it. Because they know when you get it, you're probably going to spend it somewhere else. What if when it comes to your giving, you give it first? It forces you to bring everything else into alignment. And when it comes to fasting, here's what I'm going to encourage you. In your prayer time, you ask God, tell me the season that I should fast. Because if not, it's, over, it's mind over matter and you're probably not getting what you're called to. But if you're just in a stuck place in life and you can't seem to move forward, are you willing to ask the question, God, will you grace me for the season of fasting so that I can find you in a way to release heaven on earth in a way that it never has before? And here's what I love about all this. And those are your private disciplines today that we wanted to cover. But in saying all this, I can't help but keep going back to Jesus going, remember those people? Remember that group? Remember that type of thinking? I don't want that for you because that never connected to me. I'm telling you to stop doing it this way because ultimately my desire is to connect with you in a way that you have never connected with God before. 
So Jesus gave us these private disciplines with his awesome, but Jesus was so serious about connecting with us that he gave his life up to be crucified on a cross to die for our sins that we not only have a personal relationship with him here on earth, asking heaven to come on earth, but we have an eternal relationship the moment we draw our last breath. And so if you're here today and you're like, okay, I want to do these private disciplines, but why do I need it? It's because you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And how do you get that personal relationship? Well, we have a a 42-week class, 175-page document that you have to read, memorize, and then sign. You have to sign over your mortgage. If you don't have a first kid, you have to name them after a Bible character. Yeah, we'll give you a short list. You want to do smaller names or use a a synonym. So like all... No, no, no. None of that is. You ready, you ready to know how you move into a relationship with Jesus Christ? You believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth. That's it. That's how simple that God wants to make having a relationship with you. So if you're here today, and just me giving that brief explanation in your heart, you're going, I, I do believe that. I want to give you an opportunity to confess it with your mouth. And and I'm actually going to ask you to say a prayer with me out loud in just one moment. If you're watching us online, maybe you're by yourself, maybe you're listening to this after the fact, no matter where you are, I'm just going to ask you to say this prayer with me out loud. But I do have one question that I would like to ask you. And in order for me to ask this question, could I just ask everyone around the room, those watching us online, could you mind just closing your eyes for a minute? Create a place where people would feel comfortable that it's just you and I talking. And here's the simple question. Are you ready to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And if that answer is yes, I would love for you just to raise your hand just so that I can see that you made that decision. So if you're sitting in here now and you're already believing in your heart and in a moment you're going to confess with your mouth, I'm going to ask one additional thing. With all eyes closed, most heads bowed, if you're here today and you'd like to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, could I just ask you to simply slide your hand up just so that I can see that you made that decision today. And as people are praying here and thinking here, those watching online, there's going to be a tab that pops up in front of you. There's going to be a question come into the comments that if you said this prayer for the first time, like this button, or just reach out to us. Please let us know that you've made this decision today. And so with all sincerity, could everyone repeat this prayer? Dear Jesus, today I give my life to you. I believe in my heart, so I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. Forgive me of my sins, and from this day forward, I choose to follow you. God, I thank you that a relationship with you is not meant to be difficult. It's not meant to have hundreds of rules that we have to apply by every single day, and if we fall short, a whole ritual and routine that we have to get back from, but God, you have laws in place in order to help diminish our destructive nature. But any place that we fall short, we miss the mark. God, it's just reminding us that you've already paid the price. So Jesus, thank you for these private disciplines that you gave us, that you want to give us a reward to bless us, to give to us, and to become intimate with us. Help us this day. As I say this prayer, I want you to say it in your own mind right now. Help me this day implement these practical or these private disciplines. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we put our hands together and celebrate with anyone and everyone who made that decision today to follow Jesus? For those watching us online right now, we so appreciate you being with us. Why don't you stay tuned for just a couple more minutes from some announcements. Uh, If not, I will say this, we will be back next week. We'd love to either see you in person at our Collinsville campus or on an online campus. No shame in your game. We're just happy that you're connecting to Navigation Church. God bless you. Hey, thank you for watching this message from Navigation Church. We hope it strengthened and encouraged you today. But let's not stop with the message. I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss out on a single message. 
I also want to invite you to join us in person or online every Sunday morning at 905 or 1045 at our council campus or even our online campus at nabchurch.org or our Facebook Live by following our Facebook page. And make sure to check out navchurch.org to discover more about Navigation Church and ready for this and even plan your next visit with us. Thank you for watching. I look forward to meeting you soon. God bless.